Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Stone. I'm Jenna Rose. And we are with the Underground Music Collective. Um, we are back for another segment of Drinking with Founders. So and... ready with the fun and games dance. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are joined by uh, the founder of the Underground Music Collective. Um, we wanted to break the matrix today and go ahead and bring him in because um, we've met with two founders so far. If you guys watched our past segments, we met with Aaron of Nashville Tour Stop and we met with Shawnee of Everything But Country Music. We want to talk to everybody doing big things in the community. Um, and obviously Gerard is one of those. So do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm being, I'm being interviewed on a UMC segment. This is so meta right now. You know? <laughs> it's breaking the matrix. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Gerard Longo. Uh, I'm the founder of Underground Music Collective. I and the co-founder of Live from the 615, which is our event production company, started as a live stream thing, uh, you know, during the course of the pandemic, and now we're doing a lot of shows around town. Go to live from the 615.live to find out what we're doing there. The Quinn Spin Podcast, which is the origin point, the very heartbeat of UMC, uh, launched actually eight years ago today as of recording was the concept. Wow. Wait, uh, as of today? As That's of, th- well, as of recording. This will air like eight days later, but yeah. Oh. August 2013 was when I was like, I'm doing a podcast because I need an outlet and I hate corporate America and I need oh. some way to have an impact. And that all led me here to helping our music evolve to Nashville. This is the studio where we record the podcast and we're pretty much running things out of right now. So yeah. Kind of a full circle moment to have me on Drinking with Founders. Um, yeah. I'm, I think I'm the only one drinking with the so founder right for, now. So for those of you that don't <laughs> know and haven't been keeping up with things, um, whenever Gerard has his The Quinn Spin, which he just mm-hmm. mentioned, which you guys can check out all the interviews he's done with that. Two ends um, in Quinn, two ends in Spin. <laughs> I always have to. <laughs> and um, I came on to the Underground Music Collective, and that's when we launched the Fun and Games, um, which is kind of like a second, we call it a video cast, I guess, because yours is really a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and so this in itself is kind of really crazy because Gerard's used to being either the production guy or the guy that's interviewing people. So, like, have you ever gotten interviewed before? Or? I have, but not in this studio. Not in this studio. Not in this. You? This is a first for me to be interviewed in the studio. I've been on a couple podcasts. Actually, wait, no, that's not true. I have been interviewed in the studio before because Colin Budney from Foxtrot and the Get Down came Shout down. Out. <laughs> uh, he he's in he's based in Philly, but they've they've done stuff all over, and he had. The podcast at the time was called Kill Your Internet. Now it's called On the Guest List. And he came down last fall and was like, hey, let's do a podcast. I thought he was coming on the Quinn Spin, but it turned out I was going on his podcast. So we had the studio. We did everything. And uh, so, yeah, I've, I've had a few rounds of being interviewed on shows, but there's always more to talk about. So there is always happy to come. It on. feels like one of those things you ever like looked in a mirror where a mirror looks in another mirror mm-hmm. and it's like endless Keeps mirrors there, yeah. of mm-hmm. like a spin. I feel like that's what that feels like right now. Like, cause we're always talking cause we're a team. We do everything together. And now we're sitting here interviewing you. It feels very weird. <laughs> a little bit, a yeah. little bit, but I'm here for it. Yeah. So oh. tell everyone about what you're doing now. What's new. Everyone, as you mentioned, knows about the Quinn Spin and knows about Live from the 615, the Underground Music Collective, if you follow. What's going on that's new that people don't know about? Well, you know, it's an interesting, it's been an interesting year, you know, because, I mean, number one, we're all hitting a moving target right now, right? You know, with the ongoing nature of COVID and, like, having to make tiny adjustments, you know. I mean, like I mentioned with Live from the 615, you know, we started as a live streaming entity live streaming service and that was because of covid right and that was that was born out of covid here at home i mean the the camera we're using right now you know we used you know and still use for productions you know yeah and it's interesting over the course of the past eight years how things have just like one thing leads to the next leads to the next and everything takes on a life of its own uh you know with live from the 615 in particular you know case and pratt who's my uh, co-conspirator there uh, on Live from the 615 called me around April and said, hey, we should start reaching out to venues because this place is about to open up. Lo and behold, a month later it did. So we're doing a lot of shows now. Live showcases. We have a couple of uh, larger events we're working on, including one that I think I've announced by the time this episode airs called 615 Fest at the East Room, October 2nd. Yeah, It's going to be huge. Last week's guest, Troy Doherty course going to be on no yeah, but we show. just have um, um and we're collaborating on that as well yeah, music a, city movement a partnership with music it's a city partnership movement? of all of it at this point oh. we're one gigantic um octopus <laughs> with like just a bunch of tentacles going all out over the city yeah, yeah so this like, will be mm. put on by underground music collective live from the 615 and music city movement mm-hmm. all to- 
together. At the East Room. At the and East Room. And Underground Music Collective has been around for a while, but Live from the 615 and Music City Movement both are f- fairly new. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this will be our really, our biggest mm-hmm. project mm-hmm. to date. Together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, together. All together, yeah. It's yeah. going to be an all-day thing, $20 day passes, and we're going to have vendors. We're going to have all sorts of cool stuff. Great music. But, yeah. you know, it, I, I, I brought that up, and before I went on the tangent about that event, you know, I think there's opportunity everywhere. You know, I think there's, like, you know, even in a time like COVID, which we've all experienced over the past year and a half, you know, and not to downplay anything bad that's happened as a result of that, but, like, here in the music industry, I find that there have really been opportunities to sit back, go inward, define your vision, not just for your business, but for your life, which, of course, defines everything else, you know, as you go, so goes everything else. And it's led us to a point... You know, me doing that for myself, me doing that for the business where, like, there's a lot of really cool stuff happening, you know? It's a lot of silver lining to, to the last year and a half. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, now we're at a point where, you know, we have so much on the books for the fall. You know, we're starting to think about the winter and what's up ahead. And, you know, you do look for those silver linings, you know, because without without the events transpiring as they have, maybe you wouldn't have been in a position to really think about these things. No. Absolutely. You know, I think for me, um, you know, 2019 was my first full year in town and it was just go, go, go all the time. There's always a show. There's always a meeting. There's always a networking thing. 2020 was a chance to, you know, we were all forced to sit back, you know, and really a chance to look at like, okay, is this thing that I'm doing fitting the vision of what I want, but also is my life going there? And yeah. I th- those two things, I think, I've really, you know, over the course of second half of 2020 into 2021, really had a chance to get serious about, you know, really defining what does that look like and are my actions bringing me to where I want to be? You know, is what I'm doing every day bringing me closer to that ideal vision? Yeah, you know? well, something about last year, too, is, like, I feel like everybody has went through stuff, but, like, we all go through stuff separately. And mm-hmm. last year, we all had a chance to go through the same thing together yeah Mm -hmm. so like instead of being like i've been through this i've been through that we all were like oh we all just went through this worldwide pandemic together yeah what's how did you handle that right and so tell people kind of a little bit i know you recently too have went on a very um you did hypnotherapy you did like a spiritual yeah kind of awakening tell everyone a little bit about yeah kind of how that changed you and yeah so i to backtrack a little bit you know go you know going through 2020 into 2021 you know i kind of i made the decision you know, I, I was working a corporate job full time and doing all the UMC stuff on the side, which people don't believe when I tell them because we're pumping out so much content all the yeah, time. But uh, it's true. Gerard is like the most productive person I think I've ever met. Sometimes a little too productive. Yeah. Well, and that's, that, that's where I'm going with that is, you know, I, I was I think I had gotten so robotic by the start of this year that it's just like work, work, work all the time. 14 hours a day. And then I do nothing else but work and focus on this thing. Right. Now that I've made the leap. You know, I was spending all day, every day in UMC land or live from the 615, all all the associated things. Right. And so I made the leap from corporate America to focusing on this full time at the start of the year, January 1st, from January 1st to May 28th. When I left for a road trip out west, I did not take a single day off, maybe a few hours here and there, played flag football in the winter, a few hours, come back, work, work on the next thing. And I left for that trip really burnt out. Even though we had a really good night before at the East Room, like, I was so burnt out. I was so ready to get out of here. I feel like that's before you go on with that story. I feel like that's something that a lot of people in this town, a lot of creatives in this town can probably really relate to because it's kind of a syndrome, you know, the the, mm-hmm. the hustle. Yeah. People are kind of, you know, it's great. It's really great to be to be on your game, but it can also have the downside of burning you out if you're mm-hmm. not careful. Yeah. You and you don't prioritize your, your self-care. Uh-huh. Yeah. Social media doesn't help with that because you no. see – you see all the talking heads and the entrepreneurial hustle bros out there saying if you know, you're know you not awake by 4 a.m. and working out five times by noon, you're not a real entrepreneur. Mm-hmm. What five workouts in a day does for you as a business owner, I don't know. But, yeah, health and fitness is important. I, it's important to me. But, like, you know, there, there needs to be a sense of balance. And I just wasn't giving myself that at all for a long time, you know. And I realized over the course of that road trip out to Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, 
And even after I got back, like I was still burnt out. I was more burnt out when I got back than I was before I left, which was saying something. Right, because I you was... had time to separate and, that and kind reflect of affect on your it. productivity yeah. too. Because mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys are. We're all very alike too in the sense of we love to kind of work. You get in spurts where you're like, like for me, it's like at three a.m. in the morning. Yeah, I'm like. I know exactly what I have to do. I need to do this, 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 and this. And then I'll end up, like, not really getting anything done. Or I'll be putting out stuff. Like, like for example, I had my website where I was writing a blog every week. And it got to a point where I was like, why am I spending so much time writing so many blogs? Like, this isn't really doing anything, but I'm trying to put out content. And I feel like you got in that same position where you were putting out so much content. Yeah, it was good, but it was like... Where is this going? Where is yeah. this going? Is this is there yeah. a point to this, or am I just right. doing this because I'm trying to fulfill this void of wanting to constantly pump out mm-hmm. content? Right. Yeah. And I think you know, being on the road and coming back from that trip made me realize, made me reassess my relationship with work because I I realized that you know after I had moved here. Like, it felt like a big victory lap, right? Like, it's okay, I made a productive decision to move to Nashville and chase the dream and, you know, so long to everything, all my hang-ups in my own life. But the thing is, there were things I hadn't healed from. Past relationships, past traumas, childhood stuff that started to come to the surface during the pandemic when I had all this downtime, but I never quite accessed. And I have noticed that seeping into my personal life, my relationships, and, you know, even in a certain aspects of the business. And I'm like, okay, this is a repeating pattern. How do I stop this? Well, it's also probably comes out in, in the workaholism. It does. You know, that's, mm-hmm. it's a coping mechanism to not have to face all to of those things. To not have to face that because that mm-hmm. in itself takes time. It takes, like, yeah, yeah, it takes your brain power away from thinking about the hard stuff. You mm-hmm. can't put out all that content if you're yeah. focusing on your trauma. Yeah. You got to yeah. focus on that. So yeah. it's like, yeah. oh, you know what? I'm just going to, I can't make money off yeah. mm-hmm. fixing my trauma. Mm-hmm. Right. So I'm going to put that away yeah. for a while. And that's the thing is like, I made a conscious decision. I, I, met the end of a long-term relationship in 2017. And at that point, you know, UMC as Lehigh Valley Underground back in Pennsylvania was going. And I'm like, I made the conscious decision. I'm going to put everything into this. 100% of my effort, 100% of my time, 100% of everything because nobody can take it away. Effective in the short term, ended up getting me to Nashville. What I didn't realize was after a while, it becomes an addiction. You become dependent on that, right? It becomes this thing where it just consumes you and you haven't really addressed all these things. And like, it's going to find a way to catch up to you. It caught up to me on the road, Mm. you know? And I started realizing like, I want more balance in my life. I want better relationships. You know, I, I want all these things that, you know, you know, the business is, a, is an important part of it, but it's just one. So I decided, after weighing a couple options, to try rapid transformational therapy, which is a form of hypnotherapy. It's, it's guided self-hypnosis. And basically what it does is it takes, you, you fill out an assessment, and it takes the things that you identify yourself that you are struggling with. It could be anything from, mine was self-worth, self-confidence, people-pleasing, but it could be anything, you know, it could be addiction. It could be, you know, um, overeating. It any could struggle be you have, any right? struggle, anorexia, you know. And basically what it does is it takes you back th- pretty much through your mind to pull out the moments where that issue became an issue. And it shows it to you. Very emotional experience. You're going to cry a lot. You're going to cry harder than you've ever cried in a long time. But what it does is it shows it to you. And then it reframes those traumas, whatever they are, those things that started this issue in you and gives you the tools to deal with them better, you know? And for me, it was day and night, you know, going into that session, you know, ball of nerves. It's self-guided. So like, so it's guided self-meditation. So basically the person guiding you and uh, your, your rapid transformational therapist. It's uh, not like, because when I think of hypnotherapy, which a lot of people probably do, you right. think of like someone. Kind yeah, of not like the stage doing thing. like yeah. counting down. So it's not, right. it, it's not similar to that. It's yeah. kind of like. Basically, you're brought to a state of deep focus, you okay. know, and like you, you're, you're given access to your alpha brain waves, which pretty much it's mm. like, it's the state before you doze off, which is the state before you sleep. Oh, you know? yeah. So you're brought to this state of deep relaxation of focus. So your mind is as clear to go down and access these things as you're guided through them. Is it like lucid dreaming almost? Almost, yeah. And then you are brought to recall a time when you felt, in my case, this lack of self-worth, this lack of self-confidence. And then from there, 
you go through a few more memories where more of those feelings are pulled out till you get to the root one, right? Yeah. And then what that does, again, it pulls it out, it shows it to you, like, here it is. It can't hurt you anymore. It never could. It takes away right. the power. It exactly. takes away the association. You don't, yeah. You're not looking at it with emotion wrapped up in it. Yeah. You're just looking at it as an isolated event. Yeah. So you can, yeah. I, I think, you can yeah. reframe it without mm-hmm. the emotion. You can you can right. remove the emotion from it and the damage. Wow. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, it's, you're brought to a place where you realize it doesn't define you. All of mine were in elementary school. Or childhood. And, That's the biggest one I feel yeah. like for everybody that you yeah. don't realize. We talked about this. Specifically in school. Yeah, like your yeah. childhood trauma. It, a lot of things uh-huh. can go down to your childhood trauma and stuff mm-hmm. that happened to you. Because, like, for me, too, I was made fun as fun of as a kid yeah. Yeah. for a lot of different things. I had crooked teeth. I lived in a trailer. Like, there were so many different aspects. And I, I feel like doing that, you start, you're like, holy crap, there's a lot of stuff that I was made fun of for. Yeah. And, and experience that. And that's when your brain is developing and you're becoming who you are. So those things really have a big impact on how you then develop moving forward. Right. So you kind of got to, what did you say? And like your sense of self is defined by a lot of that. Right. Yeah. It really is. Your identity. So for you, it was your, it was definitely an elementary school. It was, it was all classroom stuff. It was all kids. All, yeah. Kids, teachers, teachers as well. Singling out moments of shame, embarrassment made to feel like I was kind of othered as it were. And what I realized after doing that session is, you know, that doesn't define me number one. And also the fact that people, you know, the fact that these things happen is more of a projection from those people onto me. I mean, they're not happy either as teachers, even being adults. Right. Right. And you know, what, what I've realized is we all have things that are unhealed. You know, we all, and they manifest themselves in different ways, whether it's something as you know below the surface as like a self-confidence issue it could and it can really manifest itself in some other ways as well you know addictions you know that kind of thing whether that's to drugs sex whatever like we all have our coping mechanisms right but the key is to develop healthier ones to really be present in the moment and understand exactly what you're doing why you're doing it and just developing a healthier relationship with yourself, mm. you know, showing yourself more of the care and the respect that you need. You know, there was there was this focus during the session on the inner child and essentially reparenting, you know, taking that inner child and be like, you're mine now and I've got you. It's fine. Which never yeah. leaves you. Your inner child's always yeah. there. Yeah. And I've been um, I've been starting to look into a lot of the reparenting stuff. And mm-hmm. it's and, you know, what the thing that comes up over and over is, would you speak to a child? the way that you speak to yourself. Right. Like when you make a mistake and you are having this negative self-talk, like mm-hmm. if you stop that and you think, okay, if I was if I was responsible for taking care of a child and I love that child, how would I uh, how would I approach this situation? I would speak to them out of love and I would correct the behavior in a loving way and so mm-hmm. and that helps you realize and you would do that for your friends right. and that helps you realize that you need to also like just because it's you doesn't mean that you don't deserve yeah. you're, love. Well, you're really and hard care. on yourself too, and I feel like too, Gerard. Like your experience with that, honestly, I feel like you could write something to teachers mm-hmm. because as talking about this makes me want to like. I'm not saying all teachers like you don't know what you're doing, but I think it'd be it would really behoove a lot of teachers to take a course or read something on how to really talk to children because mm-hmm. even calling a kid out in class and being like, you messed up, go stand in the corner. Mm-hmm. You never know if you yeah. could have just installed trauma in them because mm-hmm. you didn't handle it. Cause you never mm-hmm. know what they're going on at home. What if they're getting hit at home mm-hmm. and you simply being aggressive to them messed them up, and right. messed up their trauma. So I feel like you right. should write about this yeah. and put, I mean, yeah, you're already great speaking blog. on it, but you should about. definitely write yeah. kind of a note to teachers like, mm-hmm. Hey, yeah, you know, I think everybody, especially people who work with children, could benefit from going through some kind of healing process. Yeah, themselves. Yeah, 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 because we all have stuff. We all, you know, none of us escape childhood without some kind of trauma, right? We all have stuff, but you know, the the key is, you know, are you willing to go back and work on that? You know, I've been evangelizing for RTT, which is shorthand for Rapid Transformational Therapy, since I did it because. It's worked for me. You know, I feel so much clearer about what I want out of life, about how I'm going to get there, what I want for the business, how I'm going to get there, what I will and won't accept, the boundaries I will set with people. Mm. I used to set no boundaries. You know, I used to, you know, uh, 
up until very recently, it pretty much let people do whatever you they want. You didn't say no. Yeah, I didn't say no. And I know you all noticed this during our fun and game sessions here. I would say sorry for everything. Oh, sorry, I need to come in and fix mm-hmm, this. Mm-hmm. Sorry, sorry. Don't apologize. I think we yeah. both have said to you, stop saying sorry. <laughs> right. Because yeah. me and her mm-hmm. both are on the same level when we're out with people and they say uh-huh. sorry. We're both like, yeah. stop saying sorry. Well, yeah. in my opinion, the mm-hmm. sorry thing is um, I understand where it's coming from and yeah. people who, who do it a lot. But what, what happens is that when you apologize for things that you don't need to apologize for, mm-hmm. that kind of subconsciously tell, gives a message to the other people that they should also be self-conscious and be apologizing for things. Because mm-hmm. if you're apologizing, then, oh, well, shit, I, I, and I do this all the time. Maybe I, like, you know, you're sending the wrong message. Yeah. You're, you're, you, you think by doing it, you're, you know. Being polite. You're being polite yeah. Yeah. And, and excusing yourself. But, but the effect that it has is that you're sending the message that what you just did, which was totally normal, is not okay. Right. And that's not a positive message no. to be giving other people. Or right. in the same breath, you almost give people an invitation to walk all over you. Yeah. Absolutely. Because people will take advantage of you saying sorry, and they're like, they always right. see it as like a sign of, of They go, weakness. oh, wait, you messed up? Oh, okay, well, then okay. I should be irritated It's with like you. subconsciously they're like, yeah. okay, well, because like think about someone saying sorry all the time. Mm-hmm. People who have very dominant personalities or can be dominant in a mean way might be like, okay, yeah, be sorry, you know, and they might, because yeah. I used to be that way. I'd say sorry, and mm-hmm. I would notice people would almost take right. advantage of me, and it got mm-hmm. to a point where I was like, do I need to stop being kind? Can I not be kind because people are walking all over me? Right. You know? Yeah. I just had a, a chance to spend some time with a friend uh, when I was out of town just now. And I noticed this friend doing that a lot now, too, because I, I recognize it in myself now. You so know? now you can kind and of like see it. Slap on the wrist. Every, you know, That's like, beautiful, yeah. isn't it, when you heal your trauma yeah. and you can see your trauma mm-hmm. in other people? It's like, oh, so, sorry, I was in the shower too long. Sorry, I need to get in your trunk. Don't apologize. I actually said a couple times during the weekend, stop apologizing. Stop <laughs> fucking it's saying fine. sorry. <laughs> it's fine. That's what we're titling this podcast. Stop, stop fucking saying, saying sorry. Yeah. Be- because, like, at the end of the day, like, we all ha- have needs that need to be met. They could be as simple as, oh, can I just get in your trunk for a second? I need something. All the way up to, like, more serious things, right? And if we have needs that we need to have met... And they're not hurting anybody. It's not doing anyone right. wrong. What's there to apologize for? And that's something that I've ha- had to realize, you know, yeah. is like 95% of the time, you know, even, you know, times where I would self-admonish, there was no reason for it. Right. You yeah. Know? And I, mm-hmm. like after the session and kind of taking it back and realizing what it means, like I realized like you know, how hard I've been on myself, you know, and how much like, okay, if I'm not working all the time, I'm doing something wrong. So I always need to be working. No. I just went two and a half weeks. I worked a music festival, spent a few days on the shore, spent a few days with my nieces and nephew. I'm so refreshed as of this interview. Because it was actually a vacation. Because I needed it. You well, know, that's it work just, too. Yeah, like, yeah. And to, to pay back and stop talking about the saying, sorry, I want to say one more thing, which everyone probably already knows this. You can, like, I've gotten so good at replacing sorry with thank you. Mm-hmm. Like, instead of saying, sorry, da da, I'd be like, thank you so much for your patience with me. And you feel the energy mm-hmm. when you replace it with that. People are like, oh, yeah, no problem. And mm-hmm. they, then they've, you're praising them. You're like, praising them. And it's like, it changes the energy. Bringing of positivity the whole, into the yeah, world. The yeah, the whole conversation. Conversation. So I want to talk about one. This is drinking with founders. Mm-hmm. What are you drinking? I don't know. What is this, Jenna? Uh, that is the box wine from on top of my fridge. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I had no idea. I want. There needs to be a wine. Like, a, like we need to have our own. Because I just saw Sierra, an artist, um, which she probably launches with you. Do shout out. Um, she just got her own beer. At a brewery, Ooh. she she went and did like a collaboration. She's like friends with Dustin, and does like really good music. I want to have her on here, mm. um, but I was thinking I was like, me and Jenna need to go get our own customized wine. Yeah, we should. Because I don't drink, but like uh, we would market the hell out of that mm-hmm. at Music City Movement, like mm-hmm. our own customized alcohol box wine on top of the fridge is what we could call it. Yeah, there we go. Perfect box man. wine on top of the fridge, and it's just, it lo- the label looks like it's written on with a Sharpie. It's yep. a yeah. plain just white box. Perfect. It's like in our Music City Movement font. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, um, so, yeah, t- so I want to tell people, so we know you do all of this great stuff. What do you, like, enjoy to do for fun, though? Like, I know you Ooh, ride this is going to be a and... new, exciting topic because What's he hasn't fun? done a whole lot of Because I have no life, So everyone. we know you love your niece. Your niece is kind of like a little mini. I know you've told me a lot about her. She's a little feisty one. Oh yeah. Um, you love hanging out with her, but mm-hmm. what do you like like doing by yourself? Um, like if you could go, if someone gave you an island and they were like, <laughs> Gerard, 
What's on your island? What's on your island? Oh man, you know that's that's the thing. a new question for us. What's yeah. on your island? I I am I'm rediscovering that. You know, because honestly, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I, because I've spent so much of the past few years working that, like, when somebody asks me, what do you do for fun? I'm like, uh, I work and then I work some more, you know. But I mean, I'm a big baseball guy, although my Cubs just completely sold everyone down the river and, you know, tanked oh, you're a this Cubs year. fan, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you get some flack from that, from being from PA, being a Chicago? Well, being from New Jersey originally, um, Uh, not really. Do you don't get flack for that? I I don't know how baseball, if there's, like, rivals. I don't know. There are, but nobody really cared about the Cubs up north. The reason I became a Cubs fan was because I was four years old, and my brother's a Mets fan. He's a couple years older than me, year and a half. That's New York, right? Yeah. And so the Mets were playing the Cubs. And I'm just sitting there, you know, doing four-year-old things while the game's on TV. This is like 1991. And my mom goes, oh, look, they're cubs. They're like teddy bears. And I'm four. Sold. (laughs) I I didn't know what I was getting myself into the whole 100-plus years of no championships. But when we won in 2016, I got to go to game four. We got killed during game four, but ended up winning the series. First one in 108 years. Fun fact, do you know where teddy bears come from? Teddy Roosevelt? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I did right. know that. Yeah, I, I know do that. that too. It's a little yeah. fun fact. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's not a whole lot to cheer for in that, you know, it, with the Cubs right now. Because if you follow baseball, you know that they just traded away the franchise like three times over. What do you mean traded away? Uh, they traded the franchise players for a bunch of minor leaguers. And we've lost, uh, as of recording, 12 games in a row after losing 11 games in a row a few weeks ago. Because... We just we did it's what's called tanking people. this year, where we had no intention of winning, and um, yeah, the, to build for the future, mm-hmm. but that doesn't yeah. help. My favorite fact. part of baseball is when they yeah. slap each other on the butt. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they look good in those pants. I'm like, mm. when they get done, they're like, boom. You're yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> so that's probably. I mean, I do travel. You like a bit. outdoor activities, yeah, yeah. You like traveling. You uh, mountain, I know you told me you went biking. I did. I did go mountain biking. Um, newer thing for me. It was an interesting experience. Oh, so uh, you had never really like done that? I taught myself how to ride a bike when I was twenty nine. I learned. Oh the, wow! I learned on the what? security bike at my old job in Pennsylvania. You didn't do like training wheel, like learning no. to ride a bike. My mom was afraid we'd die, so we weren't really allowed to learn. Uh, I also don't know how to swim. I still need to learn how to swim. But yeah, you do. So Wait, you well, oh, well, well, You don't know how to swim. I don't know how to swim. And you just a lot of people to don't. ride a bike. I taught you know? myself how to ride a bike. So we know what we need to go do a drill. Yeah. Uh huh. About five yeah. years ago, uh-huh. I taught myself how to ride a bike. Um, we both can swim. We'll save you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I want to learn. That's that's next. But yeah, so I was you know music fest up in Bethlehem where I moved here from. Uh, you know I worked event staff, which is essentially security with a side of operations. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I was keeping watch over the festival grounds before the festival started five years ago. And there's this bike leaning against the trailer. And I have six hours. And I'm like, well, this is a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to learn how to ride this thing by the end of the night. Yeah, there you go. And so I, uh, it was a little rough go at first. There were no brakes on it at that point. No brakes on this bike. And if there were, I didn't know what they were, so I didn't know how to use them. And... There was one point where I tried going down a hill. I had never gone down a hill before. And I start losing control of it. And I start panicking. And I crash into the side of a tent in front of a lot of people. And I'm like, oh, sorry. Just haven't ridden a bike in a while. <laughs> That's a standard bicycle experience, yeah. I feel like. Yeah. It's like I got crashing all... crashing into something really in a really embarrassing way. Yeah. I got all, like, scraped up and everything. But by the end of the night, I was, I was, I was rolling around that parking lot. Yeah. Rolling around the festival grounds. And so, yeah, I had a friend who I visited. Uh... On my way out to Utah, who was like, hey, uh, what day are you coming? I want to take you mountain biking. I'm like, you want to what? Okay. So <laughs> oh, I, my God. So what? I, and you're like, how embarrassing me to tell someone, like, I don't know. How so to I ride. waited for that. What I did was, That's I'm like. That's like having sex. Like, do you not know how to have sex? <laughs> I, I waited. <laughs> I waited to admit that I wasn't that experienced. And what I did was, because from, at that point. It's about the beginning of May of this year. I hadn't ridden a bike, ridden a bike since I moved here, which was November 2018. So I'm like, I don't know if I still know how to do this. Yeah, I have to relearn it every year. Yeah. yeah. Really? I bought this cheap foldable bike off of Amazon, which didn't last me long, but lasted me long enough to get my legs under me, 
take it out with Banks here at home. He he took me out on the streets for a couple hours one Saturday. So I could at least not completely make an idiot of, of myself out in Bentonville, <laughs> Arkansas, which is the mountain biking capital of the world. He's a good friend. That's a good friend. Yeah. So I'm out in Bentonville, Arkansas, which they have like crazy trails and... My friend's just like flying ahead of me, flying ahead of me. And I'm like, oh man, okay. Just try not to die, Gerard. Try not to die. So I'm like, it's a struggle. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, I'm staying upright, but that's about all I can say. And we get to the top of this hill, which she rode up. I walked up. I'm like, I'm screwed. I'm not doing this hill. And I get up there. I'm so, I'm like, yeah. So I have to, uh, I have to admit something. I taught myself how to ride a bike when I was 29 and I've never done this before. She goes, what? I'm like, yeah. She's like. Oh, I would have suggested something else. I'm like, no, no, no. I've wanted to try this, but that's why I'm so bad. I have to this. say that's the universe. Cause, cause think about it. She could have picked anything for you guys to do. Yeah. And the universe true. was like, you're going to go biking. I don't know how to bike. You need to learn how to bike. Not only. The universe is pushing you to learn new. The next thing, someone's going to ask you to go swimming. Not only biking, but mountain biking in the mountain we biking might. capital yeah. of the world. Right. Yeah. I didn't die. Yep. I didn't even fall down once. Good job. It was okay. Wow. It, it, was, yeah. it went okay. It went okay. Um, but yeah, so I, I did that. And then I wanted to ride more in Denver, but then this cheap bike that I bought on Amazon, somewhere between Arkansas and Denver, broke in my Damn trunk. Damn it, Jeff Bezos. Which, I, I, you know, I didn't even use that bike in Arkansas because as soon as I sent her a picture of it, she told me after the fact, she laughed out loud, called the bike shop, and reserved one for me. <laughs> Didn't you build that bike off Amazon? You uh, built it yourself? Um, I had to put it together. Yeah, yeah you had to put it together. Which I tried to put it together. Then I bought, brought it to the bike shop, and I couldn't even put the handlebars on straight. So that tells oh, you how mechanical I am. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we're getting we're getting down to the, the wire here. Um, so we know you're doing Underground Music Collective live from the 615. You're obviously partnering with us. We're going to go to the waterfall because we're going to definitely make him learn how to swim. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to tell everyone, on. like, we know where they can find Underground Music Collective because obviously you're watching this on the Underground Music Collective yeah. YouTube. Um, where can they personally find you, though, if they don't already know? Let's see. Uh, I have an Instagram at Gerard Longo 12. That's G E R A R D. Not L. I'm not Gerald. Gerard Longo, L O N G O, 12. That's really the one I update the most personally. Yeah, it's your personal one, yeah. Yeah, I mean, don't find me on Facebook. Facebook's stupid. Um, <laughs> but also, Underground Music Collective, you can find on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, which is where you're probably watching this, mm-hmm. LinkedIn as well. Uh, you can also find the Quinn Spin, Two Ends and Quinn, Two Ends and Spin on all of your streaming platforms at Spotify, Apple, Google Podcasts, Anchor, Stitcher. Find that on all the socials. And then Live from the 615, find that at live from the 615.live. Also find that on all the socials as well. We've got a lot of shows coming yeah. up. Yeah, we're doing a lot of exciting lot stuff of with stuff. the with Live from the 615 yeah. and, and with Music City Movement partnering. Yeah. We've got a lot of really great shows coming up. Yeah, we've been hosting them and we've also been partnering on so much. And it's not going to stop. Like, we're going to yeah. keep partnering on stuff. Um, by the time you guys watch this, we already will have a show tomorrow that will have happened Mm -hmm. um and then there's going to be so many other shows in the future so and every time you come out you're going to catch one of us at least there if not all of us Mm -hmm. you'll definitely catch one of us and we all kind of rep each other so um we might break the matrix again though and be on the quin spin maybe because we're breaking the matrix right now we're gonna have to do that because you're (laughs) usually used to producing it so now you're literally Mm -hmm. sitting here i usually sit in that very chair that you're sitting and in. Do it and do it. Yep. Ugh. And then the guest is usually over here. If there's a second person, they're on the couch. Well, guys, um, we're going to go ahead and close this up. We're getting ready for our next artist. Um, but it's been fun. Um, I'm Michelle Stone. I'm Jenna Rose. This is the Underground Music Collective, Drinking with Founders. And we'll see you guys next time. Box wine on the fridge. That's right. <laughs>